This is the newsroom for today, Tuesday, February 9, 2021. We're broadcasting to you on E1, SCAR TV, NTN, and Tarzi TV in Bartica. In the headlines, three persons are feared dead after they were dropped off in waste deep water in the Quarantine River while entering Guyana via the backtrack route from Suriname. Vice President Dr. Bharat Jadio says budget 2021 is one that is pro poor and pro private sector. And so we'll remain faithful to those objectives. ExxonMobil and its partners pledged to pump 20 billion Ghana dollars into capacity building in Guyana. In tonight's features, we tell you about a young female business executive for the year and a wine company based in Kitty Georgetown is on the rise. And in sport, Shepard and Hetmai give Ghana Jaguars Super 5 to win and basketball court light up project begins in Georgetown. With the news, I'm Afanar Shramzan. Thanks for joining us. We started by telling you that police in B Division have activated a patrol between Springlands and Number 63 Village East Burby's Quarantine as they comb the area for three persons who are missing and feared drowned after trying to enter Guyana from Suriname in a speedboat via the backtrack route. Newsroom understands that the 19-year-old Joshua Samru reported to the police that he received a telephone call from his mother, 48-year-old Sharida Hussein, at around 19 hours 30 on Tuesday, that she was returning home via the speedboat. The lad said his mother later contacted him and said she was dropped off at a specific point at number 63 beach and that she was waist deep in water in a very dark area. Um, around 7.30, she called me in panic. Um, it was a bunch of emotions, so I couldn't really say she was scared, she was panicking, she was cold. Um, she said she's in the boat, drop them inside the water. Um, they're on some sort of bank and she has no visual of any sort of land. Um, and the water was getting high. Well, we stick with the original plan. We were supposed to receive her at 63 Shore. So we moved from where we were and we went up to the 63. Um, and we were there most of the time just looking. Okay, and after that, when you reached there and you didn't see her, what, what happened afterwards? Well, I have some friends that I made some calls with to check other um, ports that she could, could have possibly been at that time. Again, I didn't know for sure what was going on. She didn't know where she was. The original plan I went with, but Stuff happened so I was hoping she was probably at another port somewhere. Meanwhile the police later received reports of two other persons who were on the same trip including a 77 year old identified as Baboni Harihar of Palmyra and a northern male identified as Alwyn Joseph. Newsroom understand that Joseph is a Guyanese who resides in Suriname. His cousin Naraini Shamsunder told the newsroom that she last heard from him at around 19 hours on Tuesday when he telephoned to say he was boarding a boat from Naikiri to number 63 beach. Well, now I live in a come by me, so even one summer the people pick me up. And when I be here, he drop off and I send for pick me up, I'm going to get you with him. But when he said that he reached, did he tell you where he reached or what, is, what, is, what was the surrounding like or anything? Well, he said I'm just dropping me off at 63 Beach. Mm -hmm. And when I be sent for look for them, Newsroom understands that the Coast Guard was notified and a patrol vessel has been activated from New Amsterdam to number 61 village along the Quarantine River, while a boat will be activated from Springlands with members of the Guyana Police Force and family members. Guyana's borders with Suriname have been closed since March 2020 in an effort to curb the spread of the deadly coronavirus. As a result, many persons have been using the backtrack route to conduct business. The People's Progressive Party Civic will present its first full budget, the 2021 national budget, on February 12. Ahead of that presentation, Vice President Dr. Bharat Jagio has offered insight into what the government's fiscal plan offers. During a press briefing on Tuesday at the Artichong Conference Centre, Dr. Jagio said the budget is one that is pro-poor and pro-private sector. He stayed clear of revealing any of the budget measures. This budget shall be a continuation of the, the framework that we've established um, in opposition, the framework that was reflected in, largely in our manifesto. And that framework had a few key objectives 
And so we'll remain faithful to those objectives. And every budget that over the next several years that you would see coming out of the PBP civic government, these budgets will all advance us closer to those goals that we have established. And so we made it clear from the beginning that we will dismantle all of those policies that affected poor people that they put in place. In the last budget, you saw an effective dismantling of many of the tax measures that, um, that affected poor people. The Minister of Education, Priya Manikchan, says it is likely that the Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate, CSEC, and the Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination, CAPE, 2020 results will be announced on Wednesday. She noted that GAN has almost completed its lengthy review process with CXC as a result of discrepancies with the exams last year. At the sidelines of an event on Tuesday, Manichan said that Guyanese students are prepared to write this year's exams. However, CXC announced that students are not required to write the exams this year if they do not feel prepared. We are presently compiling um, data that should allow us to make some, appointment, um, some announcements tomorrow. So for CAPE, we have gotten 93% of our uh, requests have come back. Um, for CSEC, it's 96%. Um, sorry, CAPE, it's 93%. And that the number that's outstanding, we have 33 reviews for Guyana left to be done. CSEC, I think it's 120 something. Don't, don't hold me to that number, somewhere around there, that are outstanding to be done. Um, the problem is, all of this is happening in Barbados, and Barbados is currently on the COVID lockdown. So, our, the, the, and CXC had promised to the Caribbean that they would finish the remarking by, or the review process, which would be remarking and so on by August, um, sorry, by January 2021. CXC has said that they're going to attempt to offer. Nothing is confirmed. I know people say CXC has put out timetables and so on. There's a COSHAD meeting on the 28th of this month where um, these things are going to be ratified if they will happen. So even the CXC timetable is not certain. It's a draft. Um, CXC hopes to say to us as a Caribbean that they're going to allow students who don't feel comfortable writing this year to write next year and use the same SVAs, either in January, whichever courses are being offered. Now, CXC doesn't offer the entire gamut of subjects in January, only some are offered. We tell you now that the Ministry of Public Service has confirmed the closure of the Bertram Collins Staff College, noting that the decision was not sinister or political. A statement from the Ministry alleged that the Staff College was established as a political machinery for the APT new AFC and produce an outcome contrary to fair recruitment practices. The ministry claimed that 60 persons were processed per year to enter the public service at a Clark 3 position, bypassing those in a Clark 2 position who earned less and in turn had to train the very persons coming out of the college. Further, in excess of $80 million was spent to rehabilitate one building at Ogle to house the training when for many years there existed and still exists an active training division at the Ministry of Public Service, which conducts induction and staff development programs. As such, the Ministry noted that the staff college sought to duplicate and supersede the Ministry's training division. The Ministry further noted that the annual budget for the staff college in 2017 was a whopping $175.8 million and $143.6 million in 2018. 99% of the staff were on contract, with 50% being retirees. Recurrent expenses, that is, salaries for the staff, collectively amounted to in excess of $87 million yearly. It was also revealed that there was no recruitment of trainees for the year 2020-2021 and those who completed in the year 2020 were placed in the public sector. Still ahead on the newsroom, an $89 million nursery school is to be constructed in Martyrsville on the east coast of Demerara and ExxonMobil and its partners pledged to pump 20 billion Guyana dollars into capacity building in Guyana. Stay tuned. This is the newsroom. A new nursery school with modern amenities will also accommodate facilities for persons living with disabilities will be constructed at Martyrsville on the east coast of Damarara. The sod turning ceremony for the $89 million project was held on Tuesday. Once completed, the school will assist with the overcrowding at the Monrepo Nursery School. 
parents told Newsroom that they have to walk the one mile to access the Monroe Nursery, and so they are happy with the construction of the new school. Isnel Potwa joins us now. Eight months from now on these very grounds, a new nursery school will be constructed at the Martyrsville community located on the east coast of Demerara. And will accommodate a total of 270 students. The school has been constructed by Do Not Construction and Supplies at a total cost of $89 million. Once completed, the school is expected to help alleviate the overcrowding at the Monrepo Nursery School located about a mile from here. Minister of Education Priyamanik Chand uh, during remarks at the sod turning ceremony on Tuesday said once the school is completed, over 42 students will be immediately enrolled. We have an enrollment that is upward 8 to 5 percent of that age cohort going to nursery school, which is one of the highest in the Commonwealth Caribbean. So that tells us very clearly that Guyanese parents take their children's education very seriously. And that's a good thing. That's where we want our parents to be. We insist not only will you have a comfortable classroom to sit in, but you will receive a quality education when you get there. Also speaking at the ceremony on Tuesday was Minister of Legal Affairs and Attorney General Anil Nandla, who announced that a new access road will be constructed for the community of Martyrsville. Martyrsville is being extended now, as you know, southward. There are two fields that have been opened and are currently under construction. This school will be servicing those new homes that will soon be constructed in the southernmost portion of this locality. As I am here, I should tell you as well that we are building an access road that will provide a new access to agriculture road from the most southern part of Martyrsville. We further caught up with a few residents who gave their views on the construction of the new nursery school at Martyrsville, located on the east coast of Demerara. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling happy for the children. And there is something good they're doing. And I'm happy about it. We're here because we live in the same street. Eh? Right. Much grateful. So our kids don't have to walk far to the old um, nursery school. I have my own um, car at a state court to school. But normally persons would have to walk? Yeah, normally a lot of kids I see this pass at the morning time walking. So if I pass by, I just stop by and give them a drop to school because a lot of small kids I just see on the road. So this is a better um, opportunity of school opening here at the back. It wasn't there, nothing different, but that's that this is got to walk until I leave. All right, I take taxi every day to carry because sometimes you don't want to walk. So we could be more better than if they close, less younger travel every day. The government further reminded the contractor of severe consequences if the project is not completed within the stipulated time and within the cost. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isana Lopato. Back to you, Avinash. Now, despite calls for ExxonMobil to be fined over its continued flaring of uh, gas as a consequence of a damaged compressor, at Elisa Destiny, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, is hamstrung in imposing those fines. This is according to Vice President Dr. Barry Jaggio, who said on Tuesday that efforts were also afoot to verify the company's daily reporting to the government on its production levels. Failure to impose fines against ExxonMobil for ongoing flaring sees the government losing millions in penalties it could have been receiving on a daily basis. So Exxon is flaring using about 18, 16 to 18 million standard cubic feet of, uh, right, cubic feet of gas per day. So the EPA has worked this out and they said that's about um, 1.3 kiloton of carbon um, emitted. That's 1,300 tons of carbon emitted per day. So that is what is happening now. So unlike many, most people didn't understand, and this was a public document in 2017, Exxon 
and the, the submitted an environmental impact assessment for the project. The document was, from what I gather, made public by the EPA, published everywhere. And in that environmental impact assessment, which was approved by the EPA at that time, and referred to by the minister in the license, Exxon was given an allowance to flare or to use 14 billion cubic feet, 14 billion cubic feet of gas. 14 billion. So right now, so far, they have flared about 12.5 billion. At the current rate of flaring, by end of April, they would have flared the entire 14 billion um, cubic feet. We tell you now is that ExxonMobil and its Starbrook Block co-venturers, Hess and Sinook, have made a commitment to spend some 20 billion Ghana dollars over the next 10 years to significantly expand capacity building efforts and promote sustainable economic development in Guyana. Kurt Campbell reports. Under a new enterprise called the Greater Guyana Initiative, ExxonMobil and its Starbrook Block co-ventures will work with several organizations including the University of Guyana, the Center for Local Business Development, and technical and vocational education training institutions. The Greater Guyana Initiative aims primarily to expand ongoing capacity development efforts by supporting education, job training, health care, and agriculture. It also aims to offer collaborative programs to develop a diversified workforce and business. During a virtual launch on Tuesday, President of ExxonMobil Ghana, Alastair Rutledge, said the move was part of the company's long-term and broad commitment to local content and the, re and the responsible development of the country's oil and gas resource. He said it has been in planning for more than two years. Over the life of this innovative initiative, my colleagues and I are looking forward to sharing how these programs, projects, benefit people in Guyana and give people the tools to access new and expanded economic activities. Meanwhile, in a pre-recorded message, President of Guyana, Dr. Irfan Ali, said he was pleased to be associated with the initiative and offered his government's support. Dr. Ali said that while the government lauds the initiative, it is not conclusive of expectations, noting that the government expects ExxonMobil and its partners to act responsibly in the conduct of its business. The establishment of this initiative should not be viewed as conclusive of our expectations that the Starbuck Block co-venturers will act responsibly in the conduct of their business within our shores. On behalf of my government, I congratulate the consortium of ExxonMobil, Hess, and Sina for the launch of this Great Again initiative, and I reiterate my government's commitment of cooperation for mutual respect and gains for all guidance. The Starbrook Block co-ventures will evaluate and select capacity building projects to be included in the initiative. They will consult with local and national stakeholders and utilize third-party experts, including non-governmental organizations, to implement initiatives. Current oil development activities include three offshore projects, Lisa Phase 1 and 2, and Payara. Lisa Phase 1 has been producing oil for just over a year, while Lisa Phase 2 and Payara are on track to begin production of oil by 2022 and 2024, respectively. For the Newsroom, I'm Kurt Campbell. Now, almost a month after 10 samples were sent for testing of the new COVID-19 variants at the Caribbean Public Health Agency in Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana is yet to receive the results. The Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, during his daily COVID-19 update on Tuesday, explained that gene sequencing is a lengthy and complicated process, and so Guyana just has to wait on confirmation on whether any of the new variants are here. To understand what variants are circulating, you would have to do gene sequencing. We have sent 10 samples to CARFA um, in January. Uh, for them to assist us with sequencing those samples so that we can determine whether any of those samples deviate from the norm. Um, so far we haven't re received back the results, so we, we, don't, we are not sure if there are any variants circulating here. Um, as you would also know that there are three major variants in the recent times that people are concerned with. And that's a variant that was first discovered in the United Kingdom, 
Uh, that variant, according to the World Health Organization, as of last Thursday, is circulating in 80 countries. Uh, you have another variant that was first discovered in South Africa, and that variant is circulating in more than 40 different countries. And in neighboring Brazil, there is uh, another variant that has been uh, discovered and that one is circulating in about 10 different countries. This is the newsroom. The Guyana Livestock Development Authority on Tuesday received a quantity of livestock and equipment from the Ministry of Agriculture as part of the ministry's capital projects. Sheena Henry reports. The presentation to the GLDA was done on Tuesday by Minister of Agriculture Zulfikar Mustafa at the Authority's Monipo location. Accompanied by heads of departments of the various agencies within the ministry, the minister expressed that agriculture is very critical to the country's development. He noted that there is renewed interest in agriculture. And we have seen this renewed interest where people are coming forward, where people are coming forward not only to plant rice or plant other crops, but in the livestock sector we have seen also the upsurge in interest in this sector. In emphasizing the importance of the sector, the minister mentioned the need for more investments. We have to invest in agriculture because we have seen what has happened across the world where countries that have neglected their agriculture sector are today starting back from scratch. And as a government, we recognize the importance of this sector. That is why we are continue or we will continue to invest We'll continue to invest in this sector. The minister explained that the GLDA is being monitored by the ministry to be more receptive as some of the officers there do not work in partnership with farmers. We have to change those attitudes. We have to change it and form that kind of partnership. If we want to develop our country, if we want to advance the agriculture sector, then we can't work in a vacuum. We can't work in isolation with, from the farmers. We have to build a relationship. We have to build that partnership. And as Minister of Agriculture, I want to tell you here this morning that we are working assiduously to build that partnership and relationship with the farmers. Regions 4, 6, 9 and 10 received motorcycles, whilst Regions 3 and 9 benefited from ATVs. Reporting for the newsroom, Sheena Henry. The Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, is encouraging the public to report any non-accredited laboratories that are conducting PCR COVID-19 testing. Currently, only two labs are accredited to do PCR testing, uh, Eureka Medical Laboratory and the National Public Health Reference Lab. A private medical center on Sheriff Street, Georgetown, has advertised that it is conducting PCR testing even though it did not receive permission from the authorities. There are only, and I repeat for emphasis, there are only two laboratories that have been accredited by the Ministry of Health, which is the authority to accredit laboratories in Guyana. There are only two that have met that standard, and that is the National Public Health Reference Lab, and the Eureka Medical Laboratories. Any other laboratory in Guyana who purports to be doing PCR testing is not in compliance with the directives of the ministry. When the newsroom returns, we tell you about a young female business executive for the year and a wine company based in Kitty Georgetown is on the rise. This is the newsroom. After excessive production of pineapples on a family farm, which itself has been around for over 50 years, GT Wine was birthed out of a desire to have locally produced wines on the market. Sheena Henry visited the Kitty Georgetown establishment, which has been in existence for the past five years. proprietors of AJ Science, where we do a lot of personalized t-shirts and personalized wine.
managing an excellent brand that's GT Wine. It's a local brand. It's um, all our wines are local made. And the initiative started with the excess um, planting of um, pineapple that we had. So instead of it going to waste, we decided to process the pineapple into wine. Just pineapple wine, we have a wide array. We have passion fruit, golden apple, the forbidden, which is known as the pomegranate. We have the strokas, that's a popular brand in Guyana that's made with a whole lot of barks, tangerine, anti desma. The flavors are endless. Valentine season so um, apart from purchasing you can get a wine regular it's just three thousand dollars but if you need it personalized it's five thousand dollars and we have we've prepared a package you can get your loved one face if you're such a lover of GT wine you can get the word GT wine in your watch or you can get hobby and wifey like this here inside of your watch so it's it's um, six thousand dollars for one but if you take the package, you get a special deal. Many persons say anti desma, but it's anti desma. This also detoxifies you, so you're drinking healthy, and you you feel relaxed when you're finished. Stroke us if you want to set the mood naturally. We recommend this wine for couples. So um, one sip of this, and it gives you an instant kick. Forbidden, the forbidden wine. So. I don't have to say much. When you take one sip of this, before you buy any flavor, you're welcome to taste the wine. So after you taste, then you, you may be able to make your selection. Now, working as a female broker in a male-dominated field, Cassandra Jaikaran was determined to succeed and to do so at the highest level. Today, she is the co-founder of Ocean Air Logistics, a company that offers a range of freight, brokerage and transportation services to support the local supply chain of commercial entities in Guyana. Jaikaran is a recipient of the 2020 Young Business Executive Award from the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. In an exclusive interview with the newsroom, she talks about what it took to get her there and the next steps in her journey. It is humbling as well as overwhelming because of the great lineup of candidates that were also nominated. So it is tough for me to tangibly and concretely express what it means to me, but it feels very special. No, Kirk. 
<laughs> this is not handed to me in no way, shape, or form. I will say um, I had to put my blood, sweat, and tears into Ocean Air. Uh, I didn't always start as Ocean Air. I first started simply just, it was handwritten entries then. So I started handwriting entries at the time when I was doing my degree in economics. Those circumstances led me to venture into the brokerage field, leading me to be one of, at the time, one of the youngest female licensed brokers in the country, since it's a predominantly male field. So, um, and then it sort of grew from there. I, I didn't want to only offer brokerage as a portfolio, so it ventured from brokerage into freight forwarding, transportation. It was all linkages, backward and forward linkages, into providing this one package deal. Growing up and around business, I would say that I look up to my dad for inspiration, who is He's always dipping his toes into many different things. He always has a dream, an idea, and he believes to the end of the earth that he's going to make it and he's going to, and he's just so persistent and his perseverance again. So um, just the, the belief in himself. Um, he also offers great advice. In 2020, uh, shipping was was one of the industries that succeeded in the pandemic just because of the nature of it. We have a very high import bill in Guyana. A lot of our clientele is distribution as well as pharmaceutical companies. So we were able to service them who in turn serviced the Guyanese public. So in a sort of way, we were frontline workers. We were there every day at the wharves. Um, our boys were there clearing cargo, ensuring that the supermarkets were stocked, that the pharmacies were stocked, because all of these things are imported. Ocean Air Logistics is a freight forwarding and import and customs coordination service. So what we do is we provide air as well as ocean services, transportation as well as customs clearance services. Just perseverance, tenacity, dedication, commitment, you know, it's, it's not every day that you, that you want to do. Um, what it is that you've signed up to do, but discipline requires that you still do that. I trust um, employees enough to make the right decisions while training them as, as much as I possibly could, both in-house training as well as, as outsourcing training. So that combination of, of strategies really allow us to get the best, I think, results from our employees while maintaining a very happy working atmosphere. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Newsroom. Now for a little bit what's happening in sport. We're starting off with some cricket news. Led by a super batting effort from Shimron Helpmeyer and Romario Shepard and tight bowling, Guyana Jaguars started the CG Insurance Super 50 Cup with a comfortable 56-run win over Barbados Pride in a rain-affected match on Monday in Antigua. Batting first, Jaguars got a good start of 48 but then slipped to 88 for 5 before recovering to post 235. Helpmeyer was at his brutal best, smashing 80 off 52 balls while Shepard scored 58 not out of 52 and Chandapal Hemraj 35. Jason Holder and Ashley Nurse picked up three wickets each for Barbados Pride, who are 91 for 5 in 29.3 overs when rain intervened and forced an end to the game. Pride needed to be at 148 for 5 at that stage. Kevin Sinclair picked up two wickets, while there was one each for Shepard, Nayal Smith and Gudakesh Moti. After the game, man of the match Shepard spoke on the victory and his personal performance. Mario. 
Where Mario Shepard uh, is beginning to rain now, but uh, you were raining fours and sixes tonight. You know, congrats on your performance and uh, Guyana's win. How does it feel? It feels great, you know, especially against a big squad like Barbie and Spell, you know, we, we're getting over that line, you know, I'm thankful for that. Your batting, you've really improved 100 in New Zealand and now a really uh, important 50 tonight. Um, tell us a little bit about that improvement. Yeah, I've been working very hard at my batting and you know, it's good to know that I'm reaping, reaping the result here now. So I'm thankful for that. You know, hard work. I've put in a lot of hard work. I've put a lot of time behind my batting and, you know, getting the scores. You know, I'm thankful. And you're bowling, you bowl well as well and the team won. Yeah, that's great to know. The ball's been coming out nice for the past couple of days at training. So tonight, uh, it just continue to bring my training into practice, into game, and it worked for me. And uh, you're foot fit and strong again and ready to go? Yes, I'm fit and strong. I'm ready to go ready. Okay. Thanks. All the best. Yeah, thank you. The Ghana Jaguars will be in action again on Friday, February 12th, when they face Leeward Islands Hurricanes in the 16 Round Robin Tournament. Now, Nkrumah Bonner, who played a supporting act in the West Indies' record-breaking run chase against Bangladesh in the first test, indicated they have to save the moment and now it's time to devise plans to succeed again as they look to be consistent. The second test will be played in Dhaka and starts Wednesday uh, from 23 hours 30 Eastern Caribbean time. Starting from, from zero again, um, so obviously we have to go over the processes, we have to practice and prepare well. It's going to be a different wicked um different ground different everything so it's important for us to assess assess again and as i said before going over the processes and ensure we do them well i like to win cricket games um i hate losing um that's been in me from when i was young um obviously i've played with jamaica we won five years straight and that's a good feeling within the dressing room um obviously it's been a while we haven't win away um from the caribbean and obviously, we are trying our best um, to make this one possible. Not only for us, man, but for the people back home. They have been supporting us right through. And we really want to make them proud. Um, I mean, around the discussions, you know, we are trying to keep us level. We don't want to be overconfident or take anything for granted. The Bangladesh team is a good team, especially in their, in their, back, in their own conditions. So obviously, you know, we know um, it's going to be tough and they're going to come hard at us. And we're, you know, we're looking forward for that challenge. For them losing Shaki Balasan, it's a great loss for them. Not only, you know, in his performance, but the experience that he brings on the field as well. Um, obviously, they are still a good team. Um, so we are not going to take anything lightly. Um, we are going to do the same preparation that we've been doing. We've been, I think we've been preparing very well. And, you know, we are taking all the measures now, you know, to even prepare even better right now for this test match because as I said before, it's really important, not only for us, but for the people back home as well. Speaker of the National Assembly, Mansur Nadir, has pledged the continued support for the Speaker's Cup for at least the next four years. At a launch, it was disclosed that 16 teams will compete in two categories. Akim Green reports. The initial thought process behind the tournament was to use it as a platform to edify the public about the three arms of the state, legislative, judiciary, and the executive. And our people especially our younger people need to understand, be more aware of all of the different functions of the state. And as part of bringing the legislature closer to the people, we have to go on an information campaign. If it was a business, we would say a marketing campaign. And what I had envisaged, in spite of it being a very short year, from September to December, was that we can engage with the children, we can be more prevalent in social media, we can inform the public via our press releases, our commentary on television and radio, and also working through sport to promote awareness and cohesion. However, inclement weather late last year made the plans change from hardball to softball. Davis Cricket Club Masters, for which Nadir is club president, divides the Speaker's Cup International, which is fixed for the Easter weekend. We have to make it sustainable and for a period, not a one-off one competition. And we are prepared to commit the seed 
resources to make this happen for the next four years. I know for the next four years we're relatively... Anil Bihari, who spoke on behalf of the sponsor, said the interest is high in the tournament and since it's a holiday weekend, the sponsor is starting to benefit from more publicity. We all know the importance of cricket and sports in general to our lives. And today, as we stand, all of us here, we know that cricket is the most single unifying force, not only in Guyana, but in the Caribbean. It crosses the borders of race, culture, religion, and every other thing you can think about. So cricket is very, very important, and sports in general to all of us here in Guyana and beyond. The sponsors, I'm happy to be on board with you and the sponsors who want to take this opportunity to wish you well. And I know that the tournament is still open for more sponsorship. So I would encourage other sponsors to come on board to make this tournament a great success. The tournament will be held, held on a weekend, a holiday weekend. So it makes it even more ideal to, for fans and sponsors and uh, spectators and players to come out and have some fun. Of the 16 teams, six are from overseas, who will play in over 45 and over 50 categories. The sponsors include MMD Hollow Blocks and Pavers, Trophy Stall, Venet Communications, New Doctors Clinic, Beacon Cafe, Cost Cutters, General Marines, ACS Mining, and Raj Ace Auto. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Now, after missing out on a tournament in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, under-19 players will get into action from tomorrow, Wednesday, February 10, in the hand-in-hand -hand insurance inter-county competition. Three matches will be played in the round-robin tournament, all at the refurbished LBI ground in the east coast of Demerara. On February 10, Demerara will take on Essequibo, while on February 12, Essequibo and Burbis will clash, and on February 14, Demerara will play Burbis. The matches involving Essequibo are tentatively scheduled to commence at 8 hours 45 to facilitate travel arrangements, while the Sunday match is scheduled to begin at 9 hours 15. The team with the most points shall be deemed winner of the tournament. The playing conditions and squads can be seen on our website, newsroom.gy. Now, the Ministry of Sport has partnered with the Georgetown Amateur Basketball Federation, that's the Ghana Amateur Basketball Federation, and the Georgetown Amateur Basketball Association to install floodlights at the Pike Street Campbellville Basketball Court. This is the first in a series of light-up initiatives that would be undertaken to facilitate basketball activities in the evenings. This development stemmed from interactions the subject minister, Charles Ramson Jr., had with the two bodies as part of his ongoing dialogue with national associations. We, we know that this is a court that is, quite, is used quite often uh, to play basketball. And I think it's a good uh, space for us to be able to use to get uh, more activity on the court. And when I discussed this with the Basketball Federation and the Georgetown Basketball Association, they also are of the belief that this is something that we can work on together. And that's why it's important for us to make this joint donation uh, to the folks here. We've been able to install two posts. Um, we've been able to give uh, 2,000 watt um, floodlights. Uh, so we'll see how it, it lights the court. If it needs more, we'll probably give them some more as well. But we also want to improve the court. There's, there's some vegetation that's growing on the side of the court. We, we, we're going to work on that together. This is excellent. I mean, I know the minister is working on bringing the gymnasium to an international standard currently. But um, we, we were in need of other courts with lighting out on board and court there. You know, we could um, split up the teams. The different clubs now could have different venues to practice. You know, most of the players are going to work. And we always look for that, that sweat after work. So more courts with lights would definitely improve um, not only the basketball players, but um, our tournaments that we want to televise pretty soon as soon as you know the COVID pandemic goes away. So this definitely is, a, is an excellent um, a step in the right direction. I know we, we have more work to do, as the minister said, but um, the lights is first and foremost was, was very important to us. Football News out again, Football Federation and the UEFA, and UEFA that should be European's football governing body, have started a groundbreaking project to create Ghana's first professional football league as part of the UEFA Assist Development Program. Officials from both organizations met virtually this month to introduce the project teams, establish working protocols and outline next steps for the capacity building program over the coming months. 
Once complete, the collaboration will position and enable Guyana to become only the fifth member of the Caribbean Football Union to cater for professional football. The Professional League initiative is the latest in a growing number of projects between UEFA and the GFF following financial support to acquire minibuses for youth football development programs and various capacity building activities, including the 100-day bounce back return to play planning. And Richard Hanif and Wayne Chan on Sunday teamed up to cart off the top prize in the Panko Steel Fabrication sponsored golf tournament at the Lusignan Golf Course, East Coast Damarara. A total of 54 players turned out at the golf course to compete in the one-day tournament, which was played under strict COVID-19 guidelines. Coming in second was the pair of Vijay Dio and Hardio Ganpat, followed by Mike Gayadin and Dino Besesar, Ayub Soban and Bolaram Dio, and Mahin Hari and Rakesh Hari. Arshadin Shaw and Avanash Pasad had the lowest gross of 31, while nearest to the pin was Richard Hanif. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page, and Instagram. On behalf of the entire news team, my name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching. Be safe. See you next time.